The city originally called the city clinic was built in 1985. So, uh, as clinics, we decided that it's important to to change um, the facility as as time has gone by. Um, we've invested uh, quite a bit of, of financial capital into uh, improving the services that we provide in Soweto. Uh, that would be renovating the entire facility. Um, we've recently just opened up our new labor ward um, and we've been doing so over the past few years. So we, we're still seeking to ensure that we, uh, we, we create the best kind of facilities for our people within the communities. Um, you know, these facilities were built by the community, for the community, so we'll continuously help to grow and improve. So we've uh, recently opened our new labor ward. With, which is now bigger and better, state-of-the-art equipment. The new things that we've included there is the water bath. You know, for women who'd like, you know, water, water is used also as a form of pain management in labor. So if a woman is, has a preference, this is a new thing that has been a, a put in our ward, then the woman is given that option to deliver there. We've got new beds that are state-of-the-art when the doctors are delivering their patients without any difficulties. In our new uh, maternity ward, we've included a new nursery, which is much bigger, which has more uh, better equipment, cardiac monitoring of the baby so that we don't miss any abnormalities on the new baby because anything can happen. Baby can come, you think the baby is well, can't you? If you don't have the proper cardiac monitors to monitor these babies, you can miss something. And also, you know, we've got neonatologists who works hand in hand with us to manage this baby, these precious babies. So those are the things that we've included and we are, they are working perfectly. Uh, good evening, uh, colleagues. It's a great pleasure once more uh, to welcome you to our weekly webinars here at Clinics Health Group. It's been an exciting journey that we've worked with all of you since we started with this uh, webinars, uh, the time when the lockdown was declared and we went into a period of a great uh, turmoil with COVID-19. Well, that gave us an opportunity to interact with most of you as we started this uh, weekly webinars. And uh, we, we glad that you've, you've, you've stayed with us all these past two years. And uh, we've also been excited and, and uh, privileged to have the opportunity for hosting quite a number of uh, speakers uh, from the medical field, uh, from experts in their own uh, disciplines who've been sharing their knowledge with us uh, at this webinar at a Clinics Health Group. And so this evening, we are also glad to bring you uh, such a talk, such a speaker who's going to be sharing her um, knowledge and experience and uh, research work that she's doing in the field of um, uh, uh, cardiac discipline. And so just to note that these webinars are CP accredited and um, we trust that when you logged in or when you registered, you, you gave us your full details, your, your name, your surname, and your email address and your registration number, whether it's of, with the HPCSA or the Nursing Council, the Pharmacy Council, or the allied health professionals, uh, disciplines that you registered with, so that at the end of the presentations, then we can send you we'll send your, 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 your information uh, to the HPCS or the relevant uh, 
regulatory body so that you get accredited, you get CPD points where it is relevant. Uh, but also note that during the presentation, you request that you mute yourselves and also that you switch off the video to enhance the quality of uh, the reception that we have. We know that we've been going through a difficult time with load shedding and that at times it does affect us as if you're on a generator, it does affect the quality of the reception uh, because we didn't have unstable uh, connections. And also note that these uh, webinars are, um, are streamed live on, 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 on YouTube also. Uh, but I've just been informed that those who are watching on YouTube during the presentations, it's a bit difficult at the stage to get you CPD points accredited. It's easier when you log in on Zoom uh, that your information is picked up and then sent to the relevant body. So we encourage you to use um, Zoom for the time being, but the following day, you can still access the recordings on YouTube. And we trust that, that that will be so. And we also make our speakers aware that this information is available publicly after the presentations. So you can also always access the presentations uh, after the, the, the evening of the presentation. And so this evening, we are quite excited to bring you one of the young specialists uh, in the field of cardiology who's, uh, who's joined us uh, this evening to share experience and knowledge and the research work that she's doing uh, in the field of cardiology. As we were saying that this month we are looking at uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, that we use in, in medical technology in the advances that we've had quite a good speakers in the past few weeks. And so we're continuing with that uh, tonight. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Dineo Tzabeta, who's a doctor of philosophy, a PhD student in the Department of uh, Internal Medicine at West University. And as part of her PhD thesis, uh, Dineo is successfully trained uh, machine learning algorithms, including a deep learning uh, algorithm to predict mortality and heart failure. And that's a topic uh, for this evening. And she's a medical doctor who qualified at the University of Cape Town and specialized in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging, where she learned to diagnose and treat a disease using radioactive molecules. And so she also is currently completing a Master of Medicine degree, which she passed with distinction at, as a nuclear physician at that time. And now she is also now passionate about uh, nuclear cardiology and research and has been awarded several awards, including the Discovery Academic Fellowship, the Carnegie Corporation, New York Page Grant, uh, Heart Association of South Africa Research Award, and also the Vets Chancellor's Female Academic Leaders Fellowship, um, and also the Professor Bongani Mayos Medicare Clinical Scholarship. We know that Dr. Bong, Professor Mayos was one of our top cardiologists in the country. Uh, she's an honorary lecturer at Vets uh, and supervises postgraduate students uh, conducting research in the Department of Medicine, Internal Medicine, and she's a World Heart the Executive Member in a wellness uh, campaign designed to reduce the burden of cardiovascular diseases in South Africa and a member of other committees. And she enjoys teaching and hopes to inspire men to uh, and introduce coding uh, to young women across South Africa. Hence, she had a decision uh, to participate in the Mrs. South Africa pageant. And we wish her well uh, that she may she become the winner for that pageant. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Dineo Tabeza to, uh, this evening to talk to us uh, about um, predicting mortality in heart failure using machine learning. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tabeza. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this webinar. I'm really excited and hopefully I'll come down um, at some point and be able to um, deliver this webinar properly. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Um, okay, so um, my name is Dineo, and um, as Dr. Bella mentioned, I'm a qualified nuclear physician. And while I, after actually I had I'd finished um, nuclear medicine, 
I wanted to do um, a bit of research because um, it, while I was actually busy with my MET, I realized that I actually like statistics. So um, I started doing my own statistics and now I do statistics statistics for um, all my students that are supervised, as well as for other collateral projects that I'm involved in. And my journey with machine learning started um, before I started doing the PhD. Uh, for about a semester, I used to attend um, seminars at WITS um, on machine learning for um, a few months. And then thereafter, you know, I wasn't that confident, confident but um, I just decided to hit the ground running and start doing the project. So thank you so much for being here. The title of my presentation is Predicting Mortality in Heart Failure Using Machine Learning. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, what I'll do is I'll start by introducing um, the concept of heart failure, then talk a little bit about machine learning. Um, it's quite a broad topic, but um, in the interest of time, I think I would just have to um, you know, just give you um, like a, a brief summary um, related to what I've been doing as part of my PhD. And then I'll talk about the concept of predictive modeling because we can actually use both machine learning and traditional statistical models um, to create um, these predictive models. Then I'll also talk about the PMR cardio cardiology or PMR cardio data set. Uh, PMR stands for the Praveen Manga Registry. Um, this is one of the professors that was a pioneer um, who decided to establish this database. Um, it was in 2009. At that time, no one was thinking of data. Um, and this is actually in a, in a public hospital here in Johannesburg. But even at that time, he had a vision of establishing a registry such that all patients who are admitted um, in the cardiology ward, um, all their data is captured by registrars. Um, each and every single day, 365 days a year. So that's where this data is coming from. Then thereafter, I will talk about um, the training and the testing of algorithms, but I'll focus on the five algorithms that are used as part of my PhD. There's lots and lot of them, um, but I think in the interest of time, we'll just focus on the five um, that are related to the PhD. And then lastly, I'll talk about logistic regression, which is um, also another tool that we use to um, create predictive models. So this is a basic statistical tool, um, which we also use as, as part of machine learning, but I'll go into detail a bit later, just to um, for you guys to understand what the difference is between um, a machine learning and um, a traditional statistical logistic regression. And then I'll also talk about the widely available risk calculators that are used to predict the risk of death in patients with heart conditions. Okay. All right, so what is heart failure? So heart failure is actually, the term is a misnomer in the sense that a lot of people, once they hear failure, they assume that the heart has actually stopped working, which is actually not the, the case. So heart failure is actually an, an end stage um, disease for a whole lot of um, um, cardiovascular illnesses. So if someone has um, like valvular heart disease um, or any disease affecting the pericardium or any layer of the heart, ultimately they will end up with heart failure. But heart failure is actually a clinical syndrome. It's not a diagnosis per se or a disease. So it's, it's actually a common pathway for almost all cardiovascular illnesses, whereby when patients present to the hospital, they'll be complaining of shortness of breath, uh, shortness of breath, um, maybe coughing, uh, pleural effusion. So basically the patient is fluid overloaded and it actually feels like they're drowning the whole time, especially when they start moving. So it's quite a debilitating condition with a mortality rate of about 25 to 50% in five years. And now the question is, if it's such a, a global pandemic, what has been what has been done to actually reduce this um, burden of, of a disease in, in our society? Because as you can imagine, most of these patients with heart failure they stay in the wards for a long time. Um, they get given heart failure medication, but still they demise. So this graph that I have over here, um, on the x-axis, we have the time. So from 
the time the patient is diagnosed until the time of death. And then on the y-axis, um, we have the functional capacity. As you can see that immediately, as soon as you diagnose you with heart failure, your the, the functional capacity is limited. And um, after therapy, it may actually improve and a patient will never actually um, reach their normal state of functioning, um, even with medication. So what will happen is over time, if they get maybe um, a lower respiratory tract infection or any other um, condition that causes them to decompensate, then they will actually have a more severe episode of heart failure where literally it feels like they're actually drowning in their own lungs. So we do have obviously um, novel therapies that are available for these patients, as well as um, other um, device therapies like um, the ICDs, the, um, the ventricular assist devices or um, transplant services. But unfortunately um, in the public sector, these are not readily available, which is why we need other tools that will help us to risk stratify these patients such that um, the right patient receives the right treatment at the right time. And between the time of diagnosis until the time where they actually decompensate and die, they have to be in a state where they're able to breathe, they're able to walk around. Um, and just to also just mention something related to this, um, heart failure symptoms are quite similar to um, symptoms of depression. So it's very difficult um, for doctors sometimes to differentiate between the two. There's actually a, a great deal of overlap. And um, as clinicians, we have to be aware of that, that patients with heart failure can actually get um, depression. Why? Because they're more often than not unable to participate in the activities of daily living. They're even struggling to walk, um, you know, just to get off a taxi. It's such a mission for them. So we definitely need to new tools that will be either able to prolong life or provide them at least with a little bit of comfort um, while um, taking their medication, which is why um, I thought of um, this PhD on machine learning where um, we use a data set of patients with heart failure and then try and see if we can actually predict mortality such that um, high-risk patients are identified early and treated um, with the right therapy. So how does machine learning fit in in all of this? I think the first thing that I need to do is just define what machine learning is. So machine learning refers to an ability, um, I'll just say of a system or a computer to learn without any form of explicit programming, right? So although there is an element of programming, it's unlike before where you would say, if you're writing a code, if a patient has an EF less than 40, do this or execute this function here, all we're doing is we are giving, um, our, our machine and input um, or uh, multiple features, which is denoted by um, the X. So if you have like different variables, like with age, gender, um, comorbidities, that will fall under X. So we have a function X and we use that information to predict an output, which is Y, um, or rather our, um, our, um, our outcome that we're trying to study. In this particular instance, it will be death, or mortality. All right. So a lot of people have actually criticized uh, machine learning and felt that, you know, it, it has such a black box nature that you don't actually know what's happening in the background. I partially agree with that in a sense that, um, okay, I won't go into detail with that. I think maybe let me just first uh, outline the principle of a black box. So a lot of people feel that you have this data, you give it to an algorithm and you have an output or a prediction. What actually happens in the background? How do these machine learning algorithms learn the data? Even myself, I, I will be honest, um, in as much as I've spent four years, um, because I took a sabbatical leave for four years, and I was a full-time PhD student. So all I did was wake up in the morning, be on YouTube. Um, I've, I've actually watched, I don't know how many videos uh, or seminars of machine learning, but that's what I've been doing. And also attending meetings where they talk about machine learning. That's actually how I taught myself. I'm not... Um, a computer scientist, but I will actually mention that I had amazing, amazing supervisors that were able to hold my hand um, if I get if I get stuck. Um, they basically told me that you know you're on your own. This is a PhD. No one will spoon feed you. But if you do get stuck, um, we're here for you. But nevertheless, in terms of the black box nature, um, it's partially true in a sense that yes, we don't actually know what's happening in the background, but 
there are stat statistical formulas um, in the background. It's so weird how like I've been doing statistics for like four years and um, like I'm familiar with Stata, that's like my go-to um, algor um, not algorithm um, software. Even if you wake me up at three in the morning, I will know how to use um, Stata, but I always struggle when I have to pronounce the term statistics. I don't know why, but um, if we move right along, we see that the process of actually um, training these algorithms and, and, and then validating the model is quite detailed, but also very simple in a sense that you start off by collecting data. And I must say your data has to be credible because if you give your algorithms um, data that's not credible, they will not be able to learn. Similar to any student, if you give them um, say a book that was um, published like 20 years ago um, and you ask them to learn the content and then they examine the later stage, if the data or the information that you're giving them is not relevant, obviously you can't expect that student to do well. Similarly with machine learning, they have to be fed with credible data. I cannot emphasize that enough. So once the data has been collected, the next step is to start processing the data, you're cleaning the data, you're removing um, the, the features uh, or variables that have a lot of like missing um, um, our data. And also if you have um, a lot of um, blank spaces within your data sets, those need to be filled. Machine learning uh, algorithms cannot learn if there are blank spaces in your, in your data set. Then the next step would be to split the data into your training data set and the test data set. So generally um, with the training, we use about 60 to like 80 percent of the data for training. And then the rest, which is obviously like the significant or the minority of your, of your sample, we use that for testing. I mean, it's just like a thumb suck figure, but generally when you review articles, it's usually about 70% or 80% that's used for training. So once you have split your data, then that's when you apply your machine learning algorithms and um, they basically learn patterns um, from the data that you have. And then that's when you build a model once they've started um, learning. And you can either fit them all the new data to see whether those predictions are right or wrong, or you can use that small percentage of data that you have left behind and use that for testing um, the performance of your model. So this, the training and the test, test data set cannot be from the same patients or they're supposed to be separate such that um, when you test it, you know that the, the when you test the algorithms, you know that the algorithms algorithms were not previously exposed to that data. Then obviously we have to um, evaluate the performance and they after validate um, the model. And I feel this is the reason why um, machine learning models are not widely used because of the validation part where now you need another set of data that was not used for training or testing to then check the performance of these models before you introduce them into the, into the clinical um, arena. Um, so this slide is very busy, but I try to just capture the essence of um, what, what is readily available or what's out there for building a machine learning or a predictive model in general. As you can see here, we can either use machine learning or its subset deep learning. So I will talk a little bit about deep learning, but deep learning is related to machine learning. It's, such, it's a subset of machine learning. It's just that the design of the algorithms is slightly different from um, the classification algorithms that are used um, in your traditional machine learning uh, platform. And then also we have our traditional statistics. The limitation with the traditional statistics is that there are only really two options. If you have, if you're trying to predict um, a categorical variable like mortality, you obviously have a column on your Excel spreadsheet that says uh, mortality, yes or no, right? So that's categorical. For that, you only have logistic regression available at your disposal there's absolutely nothing else that you can do. Um, although other people will say no, but there's cog regression analysis. But in terms of creating a predictive model, it's logistic regression. And then you can also, also use Cox um, regression analysis. The one thing that you like about Cox regression is actually more for um, survival analysis. And it will also tell you what features or variables um, you know, um, affect survival significantly. And then with linear regression, we commonly use it for predicting a numerical output. So say if you wanted to 
predict a patient's blood pressure, then you use linear regression because you have a continuous um, um, field of numbers that you're relying on. So it's not categorical such that we have one or two categories. So now moving back to machine learning, um, we have supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And as part of my PhD, I actually use both. And I must say that I liked using unsupervised machine learning because there's a lot of mystery surrounding that, but I think that's a topic for another day. So what I did was for unsupervised machine learning, I, I, I removed the column that tells us whether a patient died or not. And then I asked the algorithms to like cluster these patients with heart failure. We know that with heart failure, um, the one parameter that um, directs the therapy for this patient will be the left ventricular ejection fraction. So I said, okay, beyond the left, left, left ventricular ejection fraction, let's see how the algorithms um, are able to cluster this data. And it was so um, fascinating in a way to see that um, amongst the clusters, a clusters that I was able to, to, to find, um, we had a cluster that had 99.9% .9 of patients uh, who were black and they were also male, and the mortality rate was higher in that particular cluster. So this is without any training and without any um, labeled output that we're trying to predict. All I said was cluster those patients, let's see what um, patterns uh, we're able to find. And as you can imagine, as you can imagine, most of um, like industries like the banking sector, they also use unsupervised machine learning to like cluster their clients or rather associate um, their, their clients with like a, a particular product. So I'm sure you are aware of the fact that most banks, they actually monitor um, your, your, your spending or your transactions. So if you're someone that likes maybe Nando's, then suddenly you'll be finding a lot of like marketing um, um, uh, emails related to chicken or Nando's or something like that. So they actually do monitor and they use the data to tailor um, their marketing strategy so that they direct it to the people that they really need to um, you know, focus on. So with machine learning, as I mentioned, um, it's quite similar. The approach is similar to your traditional statistics in the sense that for all the categorical variables, we have um, like the classification algorithms. And then for um, regression analysis, um, which would be you trying to predict a numerical output, we have specific algorithms for that. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll focus on the four, um, five um, uh, machine learning algorithms that I've mentioned. So why would you want to create a predictive model? As I mentioned specifically for heart failure, it has a high mortality rate. We need to identify high-risk patients as early as possible so that if they need preventative therapy, such as device therapy, those devices should be implemented timelessly. And again, this image here is showing an image of an echo. Um, and as you can see here, we've got a heart showing us that the, 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 we've got an echo image this is echocardiography showing um, the left ventricle, the left atrium, and you can see the mitral valve here and then the right side of the heart. And that's another thing that I like about doing a PhD because I spent um, like the whole time, well, not the whole time, but um, most of the time um, attending ECG lectures, attending academic meetings. And now I'm very confident with even interpreting angel, angiogram um, um, images. And I've actually learned a lot about like the newer molecules, newer molecules that are used in, in, in heart failure. So I've actually learned a lot. For me, I walked in thinking, oh, I'm just going to do my PhD, but I've actually learned so much, but not to say that, you know, I'm trying to position myself as a cardiologist, although I would love to position myself as a nuclear cardiologist. Okay, so this is a table that shows um, the readily available heart failure predictive models that were um, created using machine learning. So all these models were created um, either in the, in the US or in the Europe. So this is an extract from one of the papers that are published um, on, it's, I actually conducted a systematic review just to get an idea of what's available in literature and what other people are reporting. So while I was doing my literature review, I realized that there isn't even a single uh, predictive model that uh, was created using data from Africa or actually any low or middle income country. Most of them, they're actually from North America, South America, and obviously Europe. So this is um, a flow chart showing you how I selected my patients or the 
the, the sample that I, I, I used to, to um, create the predictive model. So I looked at all, what I did was I exported all the data from SQL and Microsoft structured uh, language. Um, so it, it, SQL stores all the data in tables. So when we exported the data, um, I actually had um, an Excel spreadsheet and it had like, I think it had 12, it had 12 other sheets within it. And <laughs> I realized that, no, this is not going to work if you do it manually and you try and link um, each patient. Because what, what, what happens is for each, you'll have like a table with like the patient's name, the demographics, then another table maybe with comorbidities, another one with um, echo findings and so forth. So they're all different. And we had to find a system of merging these. And for that, I had to rely on my supervisor, Prof. Selig, uh, to Gay Selig to, to then merge this data. So we also used... Um, not that we use machine learning, but we used Python, which is programming software, to link um, this data to make sure that there's no room for er error. So he took care of that. So when we exported the data, we started off with like 10,000, um, or just over 10,000 um, different um, uh, uh, hospitalizations. And then from there, I needed to extract those that were heart failure related. How did I do that? I used the ICD-10 code, um, which obviously ties in nicely um, with the diagnosis of heart failure. So if a patient had like a di an, um, an ICD-10 code related to heart failure or um, left ventricular dysfunction, or uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, then we'll be, we would then extract um, those records and then leave everything else on the side. And obviously, if patients were younger than 18, we excluded them because um, that's what we communicated when we wrote the ethics uh, pro in the protocol. And we said that patients younger than 18 won't be included. But ultimately, we were left with about... Um, 1,024 hospitalizations that were related to heart failure. And then I further split them into two um, in terms of like the EF, those with an EF less than 50 and those with an EF above 50. Why do we do that? We realized that if you're trying to create a model, you need a niche. It has to be very specific. <clears throat> Excuse me. It has to be specific. You cannot use, um, like say, for instance, say you wanted to create a model on looking at let's use taxi drivers you need to say okay are you looking at taxi drivers that are in Durban or with like this um this experience maybe they've been driving for 10 years in that way it'll be easier for your, for your model to make predictions if it's too heterogeneous it might actually struggle to make predictions so thereafter as you can see after starting off with about 4730 um, um observations I ended up with about 500 um, index admissions. The reason for that was because the data was not credible enough. And I must say that I was actually very disappointed. Most of the data, because I had to screen it and make sure that these patients do actually had heart failure. More often than not, they didn't have EFs or the history was very scanty. And then I had to get a team of doctors to help me recapture this data because what the registrars were doing, I mean, I understand where they're coming from. The system is quite old and cumbersome, but they were only like capturing the base and shells. Maybe they'll put the history, um, you know, um, then maybe medication if I'm lucky, but the data set was not complete. Um, and we just had to really go back and say, where is the raw data? Can you not recapture this data and make it more credible? But unfortunately, as you can see, um, for actually building the predictive models, I uh, had 796 pay, uh, records that I could actually verify and confirm that these were definitely heart failure and um, these patients um, definitely had um, a, a, an ejection fraction that's less than 50. The rest, there was no EF and we weren't sure what was happening. So that's why I decided not to include them um, in the analysis. So this is a, an example of how the data set looks like, but this is definitely not complete at all. I mean, I had about in total um, 827, just over 120 um, different um, columns. This is just a, snip, a, a snippet of what's available there, but I wanted to draw your attention to our output variable, which is date that tells us whether someone died or not. So if it's a zero, it means that the patient lived. If it's a one, it means that the patient actually died. So just to clean this data set, it took me almost a year, but um, nevertheless, that's a story for another day that basically shows you if you have 
um, like a data collection system, don't rely on people that come and go, have a dedicated team or a staff member that will collect the data, will check the credibility of the data. Otherwise, you know, you're wasting time if you don't have such a setting. Again, here I'm showing you um, the different um, variables or features that are used to train the algorithm. So we had comorbidities, clinical examination findings related to heart failure, um, ECG findings, echo findings, um, angiogram findings, blood results, oral medication. And also if someone was re-hospitalized within the, the same um, cardiology ward, we would actually know whether they came back or not. So that's another parameter that I tried to study. And we also looked at the length of um, each hospital stay um, for the patients. Okay, so moving over to data cleaning. I think data cleaning is actually the most difficult part of any um, machine learning study. And um, a lot of people don't like cleaning the data because it takes long and it also means going back to the HR records. I had to go back to the National Health Laboratory Service um, um, records to find most of these blood. I mean, you for, for some patients, you find that maybe the potassium is 3,000. You're like, okay, no, that's definitely not it. No one can possibly have leave and have a potassium level of 3,000. So you have to go back and clean the data, which is why this PhD took forever. I mean, I've, I've been working on this for almost four years. So I spent the bulk of the time trying to actually clean this data. So in terms of cleaning, um, the best approach is to say, okay, are you starting with the categorical or the numerical variables? So with the categorical variables, if there were spaces or um, like blank spaces, we just added zero to say no, because the way that the data set um, was designed, the the, the, you can only put a yes or a no. And my recommendation is if you are um, creating a data set, also have um, a field for unknown so that it's clear whether it's actually a yes or a no and no one um, ends up making assumptions. And then in addition to that, I use label encoding. Why is that? Machine learning algorithms, um, they're not people. And if you code, for instance, ethnicity, um, you will have your maybe your Africans or black patients, your Indians, your whites. The moment you start saying, uh, maybe say for argument's sake, uh, black would be zero, white is one, Indian is two, um, mixed as, um, or can you just say colors is four or three, it assumes that three carries more weight than zero. But then if you start splitting these columns and having a dedicated column for blacks, for Indians and whites, then everyone is a zero or a one, then that will make more sense to the algorithm. Then for the numerical variables, like I said, I had to design box plots just to find the outliers. And if um, the, the, the reported values were not aligned with what I was expecting in terms of the normal values, I then had to go back to the raw data or the short files to verify and the information. To meet your need of tenacity as a Okay, so this, I won't build much on this. Um, I think the best thing to do is once the paper is published, because I've sent it to the International General of, of Cardiology for publication, then people can actually scrutinize these values and look at what I've done. But essentially, um, with the 636 patients that were studied, 92, pa 92 patients died, which is, um, that's roughly like a 14.5% mortality. And the rest, which is about 544, they didn't die while admitted. So we only look at in-hospital um, all cause mortality. So even if a patient died of like a pneumonia, the fact that they had heart failure and died while in the hospital, we included them in the analysis. But if the patient did not have heart failure, then that was not um, included as part of the analysis. So um, like I said, I won't really go into detail, but um, this patient definitely had um, features of heart failure. I mean, the median EF was 32 in the entire study cohort. They also had um, dilated chambers um, on the echocardiogram. Okay. So again, this, this um, slide is just a summary of what I mentioned, the fact that we had a, 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 one, a, a 30 day, sorry, not one year, 30 day all cause in hospital mortality. And um, the rate of rehospitalization was almost 39%. So I looked at how many times where the patient was admitted more than once. And 39% of the patients were actually admitted um, more than once. And the overall median length of hospital stay for that index admission was about six days in total. Okay, so now we move over to um, 
the interesting part where we now load the, the, the data that we have cleaned into a dedicated software that can analyze um, data using machine learning. So the reason why I chose Python, okay, not that I chose Python, but I wanted to use R. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with R and they've never heard of Python before, but my supervisor felt Python is more suitable for programming and also um, for um, like manipulating the data. Um, it, it actually, I believe that, but it was very difficult learning Python because everything is so strict to an extent that the, the first line here, DF, actually stands for a data frame. And then it says, um, read um, an Excel file. And then the very first time when I tried to load the data, obviously it was an Excel file, I didn't specify, I didn't write the dot .xlsx, like at the end, like here, and it, it wouldn't read the file. So I spent the entire day trying to figure out what the problem is. I mean, I had loaded data before on Stata, on R, but this time around, I was like, you know, if you're struggling to load data, you're definitely going to struggle with this PhD. How far will you go? You're struggling with the basics, but nevertheless, I moved over from that. And um, 24 hours later, I realized that... Um, you know, I should have extra specified that this is an Excel spreadsheet and um, I should have just said Excel SX at the end and not leave the data um, without that um, annotation. Now, the next step, once you've loaded the data, is to then um, imp import all the necessary libraries that will allow you to manipulate the data, visualize it nicely, um, you know, like any, the, anything that you need to do using Python, which is a, a software for machine learning, you need the libraries for that. Like for instance, um, the, the NumPy, it's NP, it allows you to like convert almost all the numbers um, that are available on a data set and, and then just like put them on a scale between zero and one. And also it allows you to, um, put the data in like a three-dimensional structure because that's another um, advantage of machine learning in the sense that it's able to take all the, the numerical or rather the data and, and put it in like a three-dimensional structure such that each observation or each patient is perceived as a vector, meaning that it has like size. So you can you can weigh um, each, each, each feature and say um, the coefficient for this variable is this much. In addition to that, you also have um, the X and Y coordinates, which, which give you direction. So you can manipulate it anyhow. I mean, traditional statistics can do that, but um, you will have to code and write um, a script for that before you can actually do it. So these are all the different libraries. As you can see here, there's a library for training, testing and splitting the data. There's a library for scaling the data and all the different algorithms that I spoke about earlier, like the logistic regression, decision trees, they're all here. So I had to import um, the libraries for actually using them. Then the next step is to clean the data again uh, in a sense that now we have to remove um, all um, features with more than 20% of missing data. For instance, here, these are some of the variables that I used and the pulse, the, the missing variable, the missing data is approximately 54%. So we cannot use that. I had to discard the pulse and all the other variables with um, more than 20% of missing data. Again, as you can see here, it says DF data frame drop. We drop the patient uh, number uh, or the file, the file number, the record number, name and surname. We also drop uh, like other important variables like the EGFR, um, the pro BNP. I was set to do this, but that's just how it is. If you have a lot of missing data, rather remove it. So what about the rest of the variables like the systolic? We can see the top percent of the entries were, 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 were empty. Then what we do is we look at the distribution of um, that data and say, okay, is it normally distributed or is it, or is it skewed? If it's normally distributed, then you can just fill the empty spaces with the mean value because it won't actually change. If the mean is, say, the mean um, systolic is 130, then the mean will be 130. So then you'll fill all the missing um, spots or, 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 or fields with the 130. Then the next step is to then say, um, or rather define your X on your Y. So with any machine learning um, model that you're trying to build, you have an X and a Y. Because remember, I spoke about the coordinates or a graph where you have like the data being put in this high dimensional space such that each observation has size as well as direction or coordinates. 
So for the X, we drop, um, we, 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 we specify that we're using all the variables that are available except for um, the column dead, because that's actually what we're trying to predict. So our Y, which is our output variable, will then be dead. Uh, um, the column that tells us whether someone died or not. And the next line just basically then splits the data. It just says we want the training a training set, a testing set. So what I did was 30% of the data was actually used for um, testing the algorithms. So if you had to imagine um, your um, Excel spreadsheet, um, the first few, but obviously it will be randomized. The first few entries will be used for training and then the rest will be used for testing. But we allow um, the algorithm to randomize such so that we don't take consecutive patients. And then over here, we have our output. After splitting the data, we had 557 patients available for training, and then the rest were available for testing the algorithm. So the 139 represents the number of features that we are available um, to train these algorithms. Again, this is from the systematic review that I conducted, which basically shows us um, the commonly applied machine learning algorithms um, that are used to predict either mortality or rehospitalization um, in patients with heart failure. And um, when, when, when I wrote the protocol, I asked my, my supervisors as to which algorithms should we focus on. And they just told me, so it's like, no, use logistic regression, use this and that. And at that time I was like, ah, oh, but why are we not using K nearest neighbors? And only to realize that actually more studies, um, they don't use K nearest neighbors uh, because of, um, the way that they designed. Um, but like I said, I don't think we're going to have enough time to go into that. But basically, it, the algorithm, what it does is um, it, it, it allocates votes. So if um, you've got a new verb, a new, a new example or a new data set that is closer to the red, uh, for, for, for instance, the red will be patients that died, then it will allocate them to that um, particular um, category. But if it's closer, um, to the green, which would be maybe patients that live, then it'll say, oh, the patient. Um, so they, it's simple, but you can't really explain like the logic or how the algorithm just decides other than just using the board to say, okay, if your three nearest neighbors are blue, then you're in the blue class. If the four nearest neighbors are in this class, then that's where you belong. Now let's move over to logistic regression. So what I was trying to highlight by bringing up this um, formula is to show that Although there's that black box, for black box nature, um, there are actually um, mathematical uh, equations in the background. So it's not as uh, it's not as um, far fetched as we think it is. It's, it's actually mathematical formulas. For instance, over here, y is our output variables that we're trying to predict to logistic regression. Now. All you do really is you put in the numbers that will allow you to classify a patient as either falling in the blue or the red. So if the output here, our Y, is anything from zero and above, it'll fall in the blue class. But if it's less than zero, then it'll fall in the red class. So that's actually how you do it. But there are mathematical equations in the background that allow you to do this. Now, with the logistic regression, again, I had to import all the necessary libraries and then scale the data from zero to one, as I mentioned. And uh, we normalize it so that all the values, um, you know, they treated the same way. Um, you know, like if you had a blood pressure of 160 and then you have a zero, then automatically, um, excuse me, I think I've got a delivery. I'm so sorry. Can I just quickly answer? I'm sorry about this. But as part of being taking a break for an advert. So Dr. Sabes will be joining us quite soon after she has dealt with the emergency at home just there. So please bear with us. Uh, she'll be back just soon. Yeah, just in the meantime, I'll just take the call. Uh, please, please note that if you have a question, please don't hesitate to 
um, just judge your down the question on the chat box there. And Dr. Sabetsu will uh, take questions at the end of the presentation. All right, okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, I just had a, a delivery um, that I needed to collect and I'm alone at home. Okay, so there will be logistic regression and um, this is basically showing us how you would then um, write the script for treating the algorithm. So you need to specify a lot of like uh, parameters, like the penalty, the class weights. So I decided to go with the generic setting where I just use whatever that um, is available for, um, for training and I didn't tweak it um, you know, significantly. Um, yeah, so this is now showing us the result. This is after saying, okay, we're splitting the data into the training and the testing set. And now we're asking um, the algorithm to then make predictions using um, logistic regression. As you can see here on the left, I have all the different patient numbers. Uh, it's, it's random, obviously, because um, for training and testing, we, we decided to randomize the whole um, the sample. And one, it actually means that the patient actually died. So this is the actual value that we have. And the algorithm, as you can see here, for number patient number 15, the patient actually died and the algorithm said the patient lived. And this is quite dangerous. We don't want this. And if you look at a patient number 407, the patient did die and the algorithm correctly predicted the patient as, you know, dead. So how do you then assess the performance? Uh, we use uh, a confusion matrix, which would um, basically tell you um, the number of like true positive and false positive samples. So obviously you want your um, algorithm to have as few false negative and few false positive values as much as, you, as, as much as possible. So if you had to then look at the structure of the confusion matrix, we always have like the extra class that you posit you, you're trying to predict. So positive means that the patient maybe died, negative meaning the patient lived. Then we compare that with the actual um, the actual results that we, 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 we are documented by the doctors seeing the patient. And then from that data, you're able to calculate uh, parameters such as precision, accuracy, specificity, and all that. So I didn't use the mean absolute error um, on my um, as part of my results, but this is also showing you that there's actually um, a formula behind it, which takes into account the sum of all the observations, and then you look at the number of, um, so the Y, J here is the actual value, and then the one over here is the predicted. And then again, the F1 score, which is actually a measure of accuracy, is also calculated um, from um, the confusion matrix. So these are the results for logistic regression. So the difference between the normal logist the logistic regression that we find with statistics and this is that there's actually some form of training. So the algorithm learns before um, making the predictions. Unlike with your typical traditional um, statistical model, um, there's no training. Um, you just start, um, you fit in the, 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 the model with like your univariate um, results and ultimately you are able to um, make predictions based on that. Because I'm sure you've had um, in most studies where they say uh, diabetes was a significant or independent predictor for mortality. It's based on logistic regression. And as you can imagine, if you look at the performance here, so zero means, um, so this will be the class that, or a group of patients that did not die. And one um, is um, the, the group of patients that actually did die while admitted. And as you can see here, in terms of like the overall precision, 92%, but it was significantly low um, for the positive class or the patients that you're concerned about. Reason being um, algorithms, they, if, if, if you have positive and negative and one class, if there's a class imbalance, they're more inclined to learn from the class that has more um, they have, that has more examples. So if you only have 30, it will spend more time learning from the 209, which is why it was able to have such a high recall rate of 77% and F1 score of 84. But whereas for the negative class, which is the minority, we only had 30 samples for, for training. Oh, this is sorry, this is testing. Let's start with the training. We had 81 samples for, um, for, for training the algorithm and the recall rate was 91%. But in terms of precision, it's not good enough. I mean, for 49%, that's like, you might as well flip a coin just to say whether someone will die or not. It's not good enough. But for the negative class, as you can see, it was 98%. It was almost 100%. Why? Because it was given 
a larger sample of patients or examples to work from. But in terms of the overall uh, performance during training, the accuracy was 85%. But when we tested the model, um, this is now without um, using data, without a label that tells us whether someone died or not. The accuracy was 74. It's still okay, but um, it's still not impressive if you look at the precision um, or the accuracy for the negative, the positive class or the patients that died. So this graph um, shows you the different um, parameters, clinical parameters that um, were significant uh, predictors, if you want to call them that, for predictors of mortality using logistic regression. So the ones over here, these are the ones that um, we associated with, they, they increase the risk of mortality. For instance, the presence of coronary artery disease, um, amiodarone, potassium, so high potassium levels um, were associated with mortality. Whereas the medications such as the beta blockers, um, sorry, the furosemide, the um, angiotensin receptor blockers and, 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 and aspirin, they actually reduced the mortality or the risk of mortality was significantly reduced, hence why the negative coefficients. Now we're gonna move over to the next algorithm, which, um, well, the support vector machines, I didn't quite like them, they're quite complex because there's like lots and lot of algorithms within one um, set. But um, nevertheless, the concept of um, using support vector machines is that Generally, with data, you can have like a, a data that you can linearly um, separate nicely where you have one class and then another class separated nicely by the straight line. And um, if you have data that you cannot separate like this, that's when the support vector machines come in because they're able to um, move the data from a lower dimensional state to a higher dimensional state, depending on, on, on the instruction that you give them. As you can see here, if you had to try and draw a line separating the two classes between the red and the green, you'll actually struggle. But if you start using a, a kernel and you start manipulating the data and changing um, the, the structure or the appearance, then you're able to kind of like separate it nicely. So what I did was, because obviously I wasn't sure which kernel to use, um, I gave the algorithm multiple kernels to use. This is known as grid searching, where when you give it like, you instead of using one of the parameters, you just say, here are the available parameters. Um, tell me which one is the best, and then I will use it. And then as you can see here, it identified um, a, poly, a polynomial kernel as ideal for creating um, the, the model that um, we wanted to use. And again here, if you look at the, at the, at the performance, um, let me just go back to the, to the, the training. The, this is the training and the testing um, confusion matrix. So the overall accuracy for training was 91%, and then for testing it was 87%, but it's not exciting because if you look over here, like in terms of the, the class of patients that died, 35 patients were actually uh, predicted um, incorrectly. And then again here during testing, 10 um, were, were, were predicted incorrectly. So these are your false negative. And then um, the trend we, we, we predicted correctly, which is why for testing specifically, we have precision of about 50%. But overall, I mean, if you look at the class that has the majority of the samples, then the algorithms did quite well with the recall of about 99%. Um, again, um, when we look at the testing, it was 95%. So there wasn't that much of a significant drop. And again, if we look at the features um, that were responsible for, um, you know, increasing or rather responsible for uh, causing death in these patients, over here we can see that um, potassium again is appearing, coronary artery disease, um, the presence of um, the second heart sign, which is soft, and right bundle blend block and hepatomegaly. So some of the values didn't make sense. If you look over here, these are the, the, the kind of like protective uh, features like Lasix, beta, block, beta blockers, a uh, tone. But the smoking, I wasn't quite sure how this ended up here because now it suggests that if you're a smoker, uh, you're more likely to leave uh, or rather survive while admitted. Then I thought to myself, you know, rather than removing this, uh, let me just be honest and say maybe the reason is if someone is a smoker and the doctors are aware of that, they're more likely to, um, you know, uptrade their medication. They're more likely to cancel their patient. But we really don't know, which is another issue with machine learning um, algorithms. I remember there was a paper that I read that said, um, you know, patients with asthma uh, who are admitted with the lower respiratory tract infection, they're more likely to leave 
then I was thinking to myself, that doesn't make sense. And only to realize that in the discussion, the authors then state that um, almost all their patients who are asthmatic, the protocol is they need to be sent directly to ICU and that will obviously increase their chances of survival. So you always need to um, interpret everything um, into context, but also not hide the things that do not actually make sense. Okay, so now we're moving over to our third algorithm, um, the gradient boosting. Um, the gradient boosting, it's a bit complex in a sense that it's, it's, actually, it's actually um a combination of decision trees. I'll talk about decision trees later. But what the algorithm does is it'll split the data into like multiple samples and then create like decision trees where, for instance, they'll say, is the patient over the age of 80? If the answer is yes, then it'll ask you the next question. If the answer is no, then it'll ask you the next question and so forth. So it'll create these multiple trees and then um, combine them ultimately to come up with one solid tree that is able to uh, make predictions. So the gradient nature comes in a sense that um, the, the, the creation of like the trees is stochastic in nature, meaning that you start with a tree, maybe that's not doing well, but over time um, you come up with a model that is able to actually make these predictions. So as you can imagine, there are a whole lot of like parameters that you need to specify, like the maximum depth, how many layers of the tree do you want, the learning rate, how, how many times is the algorithm meant to just keep trying and learning from the data. So again, we use grid search to say, here are the, the, the parameters, tell us which one is the best and use that for training the algorithm. And as you can imagine, um, the confusion matrix again here shows us that 50 of the examples were predicted incorrectly during um, training, although the accuracy was 86%. So this is the overall accuracy. And then for testing as well, we had um, an accuracy of 83%, but 15 patients uh, were not predicted correctly. But if you look at the overall training accuracy, it's about 86% and 84% um, during testing. So this is again showing us that algorithms can learn, but if you deprive them of like enough examples, they won't perform as well as they should. And then over here, we see all the features that um, were responsible for um, creating this predictive model. So we know that the most important feature was enalapril, the beta blocker. So this is in, in the order of the importance all the way down to, um, you know, like the presence of a dilated cardiomyopathy. HIV is also down here. Um, right atrial dilatation is also further down. But we know, I mean, we, I've, I've actually mentioned this, that, you know, we heart failure medication does have a role in terms of improving patient survival, but nevertheless, it depends on the treat on the dosage that you're giving the patient. You will need to uptrade the dose and give the patient the right guideline, medi uh, um, gu guideline recommended therapy in order to see benefits. Um, decision trees, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, 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 as, as people in the medical field, um, I think we're very much familiar with um, such algorithms where um, you have like your flow diagram that says, is the patient above the age of 60? Yes or no? If yes, this is what you need to do. If no, this is what you need to do. So decision trees, they follow the similar concept where um, the trees try and or the, rather the algorithm tries to split the data depending on the, um, the level of randomness or impurity um, in the data. And then they'll then allocate a score of like either zero or one, depending on the performance. So again here, this is just showing how difficult it was or a bit complex to actually like train the, the algorithm. So again, we use grid searching where we just like feed the, the algorithm all the available parameters and then it will tell us that all oh, the best um, hyperparameters use a maximum depth of five and the minimal sample speed of two. And that's exactly what we did. And unfortunately, in as much as you see, like this is now the training um, during training and also during testing, as you can see here, the precision was 96%, but again, was really uh, low for um, negative class in a sense that, um, you know, you, you cannot actually use the decision trees to make predictions if less than 50% of the of the samples were predicted incorrectly. And again, the reason for that was because we had such a small sample size available for us to um, you know, train these algorithms. So this is what the output was. Uh, as you can see, there was a whole lot of like um, splits 
which is why the algorithm was eventually confused after a while. Um, so over here, you won't be able to see the writing, but I just wanted to show you like how it'll come up with the decision. So over here, I think it was beta blocker. So if your patient is, is, is on beta blocker, you move to the left. If the patient is not on beta blocker, you move to the right. Then it'll ask you the next question and so forth until you end up with the two classes of a patient that lived and the patient that died. So then I try to simplify it. Um, see over here, we have our Gini index, which is 0 0.5. It basically shows that the split is almost even. And again, if a patient was actually on beta blocker, then the next question to ask is, um, what was the urea? Is the urea less than 1.5? If the answer is true, you ask the next question, what was the systolic blood pressure? If the systolic blood pressure was less than um, 130, then the patient would you would say, okay, the patient died. So it, it follows your typical um, scheme of how you would make a decision as a human being when you see a patient with heart failure in the wards. Okay, um, the artificial neural network, it's, it's actually a subset of deep learning or a rather a subset of machine learning. The only difference is the way the algorithm is structured. So it'll resemble the, the neurons that you find in the brain. Um, neurons, as we all know, um, they are the functional unit in the brain. So if you think of how um, a signal is transported in the brain, you start off with an, a, a signal coming to the cell body and then from there it moves down the axon and eventually to the nerve terminals and then it will move on to the next nerve by releasing um, your special um, um, neurotransmitters in the brain. So this is how a, an artificial neural network algorithm is designed. This is how it looks like. You will start off with um, your features or um, input variables um, in, in, in blue over here. And if the variable is strongly associated with um, the risk of death, then that variable, depending on its weight, will light up and, and communicate with the next layer within the neural network, such that ultimately the ones that keep firing up, the ones that keep propagating the response will then um, lead you to your output layer, which will tell you whether the patient died or not. I think this deserves a lecture on its own just to unpack how the algorithm uh, works. So within the algorithm, um, there are different um, units that are known as ReLU. So ReLU means um, rectified linear unit. So that will be um, a parameter that is able to measure the, the the signal that's coming from each of the variables. So if the variable if the if, if the signal say is one or closer to one, then that that that, that variable will be taken uh, further to um to 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 then try and, and and come up with the prediction. If say for instance the signal is like less than zero point five, then we'll bank that and move on like that, such that ultimately you will have a constellation of features that are able to explain why the patient died. So again, it was cumbersome um, designing the, the, this model. It actually took me forever. I had to just spend, I think, about two weeks uh, just learning what um, artificial neural networks are and how predictions are made. Again, I use grid searching to then put all these different uh, parameters and say, here, yeah, just tell me which ones are the best. And um, based on that, we're able to find an accuracy of about 80%. So another limitation of um, the artificial neural network is that it doesn't really tell you which features are responsible for um, you know, the, the output var variable that you're trying to study. And what I did was I used um, something known as Shapley additive explanation. So you can actually use this for any algorithm so that you find um, the features that are strongly associated with um, what the model was able to produce. So the dots over here, these are all the different patients. So it's patient one, patient two, and so forth. So if there's an inclination to move, to, to, to move towards the left, it means that that value was protective and the movement towards the right, it means that that value um, was actually a significant risk factor for death, for death. For instance, over here, we can see the aspirin. Most of the patients were on the left and it, 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 the fact that the color is red, it means that the aspirin was protective. Uh, and allopril, you know, it's kind of like almost similar, the protectiveness and the risk. So we can't really say much, but um, there are other features like potassium, as you can see, the higher the potassium, the higher the risk of mortality. Similarly, with, with the demigrate, most of the patients fell towards the left. And this is one of the features that significantly affected um, 
the predictive power of the artificial neural network. So over here, I know a lot of you have heard of the rock curve. So this is basically like a summary um, showing us um, like the overall um, ability of each of this model to discriminate between the positive class and the negative class. So if the if the um, error under the curve is 0 0.5, it means that that model cannot predict. You have to like flip a coin to make predictions because there's a 50% chance of patient being in either the positive class or, the patient, or, 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 or part of the class that lived or um, part of the class that actually died. And again, here we see that the artificial neural network performed quite well with um, an error under the curve of, of 0 0.8, followed by logistic regression, the support vector machines. Decision trees didn't do well at all as predi predicted because our data set was too robust. It couldn't really split the data nicely because we had too many features. Now we move over to the biostatistics. Um, very simple. The first step is to create um, a univariate model. So you take the dead, um, the, the, the output feature or variable which is dead, and then you, you, you compare each and every single parameter to see if um, with the dead output to see if there's any um, correlation or any relationship. If you can just look here, this is for um, the days admitted. So the number of days the patient was actually in the hospital. And over here we have the P value, which is 0 0.0112. And it it's actually means that the, the number of, like if a patient was admitted for longer, the risk of death was actually higher. And um, this is just the, the, the traditional statistical model. So what I did was I did, I ran a model for each of the parameters or clinical parameters that we have available. And then all the variables that had a p-value less than 0 0.05, I then included them um, in, 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 in the final multivariable logistic regression. So for this, you can actually even use um, a p-value of like less than 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 because for now, you're not looking for um, statistical significance, but you're just looking for any values that kind of have like um, a relationship with your output variable that you're trying to study. And again, here, very simple, straightforward, you just call the name of the, 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 the model that you're trying to use, and then you fit all your data into that. Um, again, if you look at the p-value here, uh, uh, values such as the, or rather parameters such as the, um, the aldectone, um, coronary artery disease, enalapril, Lasix, they all had significant p-values. So essentially what machine learning discovered is very much similar um, to what our logistic regression model um, identified. But the main advantage of machine learning is um, the moment you, you keep fitting the, the model more data, the predictions become a more um, accurate. And um, the fact that the machine can learn over time, it means that even if, say, the patterns, um, like in patients, they change, or your data set changes, or something happens, they will still continue learning, you know, no matter what happens to your data set, they will still continue learning, and their capacity to make um, predictions will improve over time. So this is a summary of what I did. I won't go into detail with this. It just basically captures the essence of what I did and reports the significant uh, findings. Now, the question is, we've trained those algorithms. What's next? Where to from here? The next step will be to then create a risk calculator that um, doctors across the country or even in Africa in general can use um, to then stratify these patients. So this uh, particular risk calculator estimates the, the, the risk of mortality. So it's one year and three year risk of mortality in patients specifically with heart failure. Then as you can see here, all you do is you input your values, but this was not created using machine learning. They use your traditional statistical logistic regression and it works perfectly. But the problem is um, it may not be applicable in our setting because we know that the patients in high income countries, they have access to newer molecules that advance um, um, the longevity, whereas in, in our country, they may not be readily available. So it may not be easily reproducible unless if we test it and make sure that we can actually use it or rather validate it in our setting. The next one also predicts the risk of death, but um, it's coming from um, the data from um, a trial. So it was a multi-center trial um, that, that was conducted in high-income countries. Again, um, Africa or any of the low income, low and middle income countries were not included um, in this particular trial. And the main issue with using trial data is that 
You cannot generalize the findings to the general population because the patients are carefully screened. You may find that maybe all of them had normal kidney function, maybe only a few had diabetes. So they may not be, the this particular risk calculator may not be applicable um, in our environment purely because of those reasons. So I refer you to um, the two articles that I spoke about. Um, one is a narrative review that um, talks about the different algorithms that are available. And then the second one is a systematic review that I spoke about earlier. If you just Google Mbanya, you should be able to find these articles. So in conclusion, um, machine learning algorithm, algorithms, they can learn. Um, depending on like the, obviously the number of samples that are available, but most importantly, patient need to, I mean, the data has to be credible. If you give algorithms data that is not credible, you will not be able to make accurate predictions. And class imbalance is a common problem in the medical field, but there are techniques available that will help you maybe to create synthetic values that you can use um, to increase your sample size. But we didn't do that um, as part of the PhD because we felt we couldn't um, interrogate the quality and the nature of this variable. So what we did was apply class weights to um, try and balance out the, the classes such that um, if, the, uh, the, if, if the algorithms make um, wrong predictions for the class of interest, that being the, the positive class or the patients that died, then you penalize it more um, compared to, as compared to when um, they make wrong uh, predictions using um, the, the, the class of patients that lived. And as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's mandatory to have databases and also find a dedicated team of data capturers that will be able to capture the data, verify the credibility before you can use anything. And I feel it's about time that we establish um, departments of in intelligent medicine in academic institutions such that um, most of our patients, uh, when we discharge them home, we give them wearable devices, maybe like a whole time or a blood pressure machine, and we constantly monitor um, the, their vitals and parameters such that if we catch um, maybe like a, a significant decline in their blood pressure, then we call the patient, we say, come in. It doesn't matter how they feel, we've picked up a problem, they need to come in. And as I mentioned earlier, um, risk calculators have capacity of transforming patient management. So these are the gentlemen that are behind um, my PhD, Professor Nzijana, who is my primary supervisor, Professor Tuge Silig, and Professor Eric Klug. Eric Klug was quite instrumental because he is actually um, an expert in heart failure, and he knows quite a lot about heart failure. He sees um, heart failure patients at Jobic Gen every Wednesday or so, so he knows our uh, our, our population quite well. And then I would also like to acknowledge my sponsors that paid um, um, for, for this whole process, um, be it my stipend or research-related expenses, and I am grateful for their support. And last but, but not least, I would like to also thank Malondi. Actually, the delivery that was coming through, it was her just bringing in another dress. This beautiful two-piece that I'm wearing is from her. So please um, check out her um, online store. She sells amazing clothes. And do please, please, please vote for me. Um, this is for Mrs. South Africa. I entered Mrs. South Africa because I wanted to make a difference by delivering um health-related information to um, the public, but I knew that showing up as Dino may not be enough, so I needed to kind of like elevate my profile a bit, and people would obviously, you know, take me more seriously if, say, I've got an event, and I say, oh, yeah, Mrs. South Africa, or, you know, the princess is coming, rather than saying Dino. Unfortunately, people don't really care about the accolades. They don't care if you've got a PhD or a master's. All they want is knowing who you are and how you look like on social media. So please, if you can just all like pick up your phones, go to your um, SMS um, icon, and then you SMS Dineo Tabeze to 47587. Each SMS is charged um, at three rand. I would really appreciate that. And also, if you want to follow my journey on social media, this is my handle at Dineo Tabeze. And on LinkedIn, I'm using Dineo Mbanya because I haven't, the HPSA has not yet um, change my surname so it's best to use um you know my maiden surname and thank you so so much i'm happy to take any questions if any thank you very much uh, dr Therese. there should be lots of questions um someone just sent me a message uh, you know been chatting as we listen to you giving such an awesome 
presentation that uh, whew, she uh, she's a genius <laughs> and Thank such you. such complicated <laughs> stuff. Thank you so much. Yes, I mean, oh, uh, I'm so glad some of our young people are this brilliant. You know, young doctors, you know, becoming doctors, uh, we, we, we're in good hands. And um, I've seen one of our top uh, nuclear physicians is also, I hope he's still here. Professor Max Atheri, you might know him. Oh, yes, that's so probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was listening to you. I hope, uh, Prof. Atheri, perhaps mm-hmm. you've got one, word say, one or two words to say. You know, when you're doing R modeling and uh, Py, with Py, Python, and I, I remember some time back in 2008, I was in Belgium for performance, was in a some kind of a sabbatical, and they were doing quantitative, quantitative risk analysis, and we're doing R modeling. And we sat in a class, I mean, for four months, I couldn't understand what this thing is all about, trying to uh, do some, uh, uh, come up with a formula to predict uh, spread of infection and when COVID came in, it took me back to those years that you could clearly predict how, you know, infectious uh, this, this, this condition was going to be and how many people were actually catch it. I think they were taking us back to the Spanish flu that time we doing some studies on the Spanish flu. And you're doing some complicated stuff. And I think uh, you said you spent so much four years doing your PhD, it's, it's quite amazing. But I think we can see why it took such a long time. And amazing stuff that you're doing. And thank you very much for, for, for coming here. Um, thank you. Anyone else with another question? Uh, maybe just, you know, I'm not sure if there's any question or they. Um, I think that, that Dr. Apova says, could you tell us about bias in algorithms and how do we do that? How do we, the clinicians, evaluate it? How can we do it? Uh, Okay, so most algorithms, um, when they learn from the data, so this is while you're still training them, you may find that the accuracy levels or the performance is, is, is amazing, but the moment you test them, then they perform poorly. Now, the question is, what, like, how do you then gauge poor performance? If, for instance, um, during training, the accuracy was 80%, and now during testing is 40%, you cannot use that that model. There's bias, so there has to be kind of like um, synchrony between the values that you find during testing and training. If there's a significant difference, rather not use um, that algorithm because obviously there's bias. Which is why even now, the next step is to, um, if possible, it's just that you know there's a lot of resistance in South Africa when it comes to collaborating and 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 and, 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 and creating um, multi-center um, studies. So the next step from here, we cannot use this. Even if there's like a 90% accuracy, we still need to input new data that was not used to train or test the model. And the data has to come from different sides because the algorithms are so sensitive. Like the issue of bias is quite real in a sense that you may find that most of the patients that come to Charlotte, um, they would have been maybe seen um, by maybe two doctors before they, they, they arrive um, at, 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 at our referral center. Whereas in other centers, maybe you find that the patient has first been seen in a local clinic, say like a patient at Guanohoma, and that's quite far. So by the time they end up at like Ngosi Albert Hospital, you know, the conditions are completely different. The waiting periods are completely different. So we cannot then generalize them because of that bias, which is why when you now try and introduce them in the clinical setting, you have to have multiple sites, um, different sites, and that actually qualifies as validating it. So to avoid bias, you have to use a model that was validated using um, data that was not used to train or test the model. And secondly, you have to look at um, the performance matrix. I know a lot of authors, they actually have like the predictions made for the negative class and then they'll report the overall accuracy that is not fair you you need to know what the accuracy was for the class that's being predicted what was the the precision and that will enable you to make um, a decision as to whether you can use the algorithm or not sure wonderful um, you know, this information, you, you said patients can use a risk calculator or you, 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 you advocate for that so that you, you can intervene timelessly. Why would medical aid uh, and insurance companies, this kind of information can be useful for them to, I'm sure they would want to up the premiums once they know patients who've got heart failure and they can predict the mortality and say, you know, we've got to pay out possibilities. Is it one of the things that that's possible for 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 use? 
Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Initially, when I thought about the next phase, I thought maybe we can just share this data with medical aid companies, then they'll know what to do. But um, it's actually not that simple because um, you have to also think of where is this data coming from? Who is more likely to benefit from it? And we know that with medical aid companies, once you hand it over to them, um, you know, they might say, okay, today, well, here's maybe a million. <laughs> we'll do whatever you want with it. But for me, I, I want us to transform patient care in South Africa. A lot of patients are dying unnecessarily, number one, because of lack of um, access to the necessary services that they need. So why not make a difference where this where this is a, a greater need, but I agree with you absolutely. Medical aid companies can use it, but for me, I feel it's more suitable to be used by doctors because we don't want a, a, a patient to then start um, estimating the risk of death and it's 30%, you know, they're panicking, they're stressing, and, and they suddenly like die of an MI because they estimated the risk of death to be like 30%. So in my mind, I would rather like introduce it to um, doctors and make sure that before they use the app, they give us um, the contact details, the MP number to verify that they're actually health practitioners. And you also guide them as to how to use the app. Because if you provide such information to, to um, uh, patients, they might actually not even understand, um, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah I think it's going to be useful tool to have for, for doctors, both in specialists and even GPs to have this information and better manage patients and be able to make timely intervention. Just I like what you were showing the a patient that you can predict mortality uh, with certain parameters that you want to do your laboratory tests and also what medication they are on. It helps you to make that prediction. I see Professor Satel has got a comment to make. I'm going to ask him uh, just to unmute himself and maybe uh, yes, talk about this prof you spoke about AI and machine. Uh, uh, there may be other colleagues also from the um, from from the industry who may have joined us. I think there are some colleagues who are going to join us this evening from uh, the part of the the running the oncology units. Uh, mm. in the, yeah, so maybe if they are here to me, make comments what Prof. Satakha is about to talk to us about. You can unmute yourself, Prof. Thanks, Chair. And, 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 and hi, you know, that, that's a great presentation. I, yeah, they, they, they really um, I commend you on, on, on this excellent work. It really will really open avenues for, for better management. And, and clearly, it will, it will take the theory of speaking about personalized medicine to really um, to, to be practical. And, and I think you're one of the few that will have this a type of a skill. And, and, and one would encourage uh, you to uh, not only uh, leave it here, but, but then take it to, 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 to the oncology, uh, where we'll need your skill and, and train mm -hmm. other colleagues in in, in that space. But, but I think, uh, Chair, I would like to say to her, we wish you the best with uh, Mrs. South Africa. We, we are behind you, but we need this uh, skill in, in, in other various sectors. And, and colleagues will actually grab on this uh, if, if they get your, 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 your tutorial. Thank you so much. I think for me also, it's mandatory for me to do that because I realized that if I spend a lot of time not working with algorithms, you kind of become rusty, you forget. So I would really love an opportunity to teach and collaborate with other clinicians and we see how we can use machine learnings to um, machine learning algorithms to transform patient care. I'm definitely more than interested um, in doing that. Sure, yeah. Sure. We, we will be sharing this information about your Twitter handle, all those uh, social media uh, 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 contact details. Uh, okay. with, with, when I want to you know, give feedback to the colleagues, because we also want uh, uh, colleagues to give us feedback about these presentations. We do that every time after the presentations. So when we do that, we'll, uh, we'll ask Zuki to make sure that we, we include all that information. Uh, so Thank that colleagues are here, should, all of them should vote for you. Please, uh, please get that. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Bruce Mimela, I was thinking about this question, but I'm glad that he's raised it. Was there any interaction with actuaries in relation to this uh, predictive model? Um, sorry, please say that again. Any interaction with? With the actuaries. Actuaries, yeah. Oh, because no, it was just me. That's why it took so long. It was just me and the laptop. And if I get stuck, I call Prof. Um, Silik. So what we did was to ensure that there's um, continuity. We had meetings every twice a month. So every for four years, 
without fail, they were there. Dunia, where are you? Where, what's happening? For four years. So I didn't work with anyone. It was just me, this laptop. It was painful, but um, I'm just grateful for the journey because there were instances where I would get stuck for like the entire day. I don't know what to do. Like the algorithm is not working, but I would then just like go back to... Um, notes that I have or YouTube or articles to try and find a solution. If I still can't resolve the issue, then I will consult Prof. Um, Silic who will then look at the algorithm because he's actually the professor of computer science and then he'll just help me out. So it was just me and no one else. Yeah, no thanks. Yeah, we, we, we have it towards the end of this uh, presentation. Just for me to sound intelligent, I just looked at something and was you, you mentioned this at the beginning uh, when you know, said you, know, you need to be careful what you feed into the into the or into the machine. Uh, people talk about data leakage and also predict uh, reproducibility of, 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 of information. Perhaps maybe if you can just touch on that here. Yeah. Okay, that so when, with, when you yeah, when you when you feed in data, yeah. Okay, yeah. so with, with with if if you have um, a database. Um, it has to be password protected because in as much as you can, um, you know, train this algorithm, make sure the data is credible. But if there's a breach in the integrity of the data or someone changes it, um, you know, that would be an issue. For me, my recommendation is you will need to be able to track who is logging in, who is used to doing what. There has to be that um, facility in place where someone is actually able to log in and you're able to track um the time at which they lock in and for how long did they export the data and you lock those parameters. You can actually lock that functionality to say, um, if it's a registrar, I'm sorry, I don't have an issue with registrars, but I've got a problem with the fact that they didn't um, capture this data accurately. And these are official medical records. We know that after a certain period of time in the public sector, the, the, rec the records are actually destroyed. So we are not preserving data in South Africa and people, if they're, they're putting in um, data that is not credible, it defeats the whole purpose. Even for medical legal reasons, you know, yeah, if the data exactly if the data is not credible, you completely um, mismanage the patient. So my recommendation would be obviously password protection, monitor um, who's logging on, and have one um, um, like a data administrator, someone that will oversee the quality and the integrity of the data, someone employed specifically for that. You can't just allow random people to come, you do what they want and you leave it at that. Someone has to monitor what people are doing. If a patient has heart failure and you have not documented the EF, I will go back to that person that was capturing the data Hence why I will need to know the name and the same name and say, where is this parameter? But as a measure of protection, unfortunately, we have um, a lot of cyber bullying and, 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 and cyber attacks whereby people are able to write complicated algorithms to then infiltrate your data and just take it as they want. And um, till date, I don't think there's one um, solid um, solution to that. But um, I think in the near future, we'll get to that where it's almost impossible to breach into the data set. Yeah. No, no thanks for that. Uh, there's, there's the last question that has just come through now. What what confounding variables in using screening apps for heart failure management can be expected in practice? Confounding variables in using screening apps for heart failure. Yeah. I think um, I'm just trying to understand the question. So confounding variables, so variables that might affect the predictive abilities um, of the of the algorithm. I think if, for instance, um, because now the, 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 the person that's asking the question, they want to know specific um, confounding variables. But in my mind, what I can think of is um, if there's collinearity. Say, for instance, you put in a variable like the BMI, which takes into account the, the weight and the height. And then you also add the weight and the height. That will cause collinearity. But in terms of the specific confounding variables, I cannot think of any right now at the top of my mind because generally when you create this um, algorithm specifically, um, you remove var variables that, um, you know, if one goes up, then the other one goes up as well. Automatically, we remove them so that you know that if there's a relationship between the predictor and the actual um, output that you're trying to predict, it's a genuine, it's authentic, it's not related to anything else. So, um, it would be very difficult to, to respond to this question knowing that, that there are such 
um, gatekeeping strategies in place that ensure that variables that are highly, uh, it's just that I didn't mention it here, but we remove them before you even start um, creating um, any screening app or anything like that. Oh, thanks, thanks a lot for that response. Uh, before I give a uh, hand over to Dr. John Bohopa, who's our uh, occupational health medicine uh, manager within clinics, um, just on the, the someone here who's logged in, you said you were having challenges with uh, changing your surname. We'll, we'll ask them to attend to that matter from the HPCSA side. <laughs> He's listening and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that he will help us uh, to help you. Uh, no, to you. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not there. I was complaining. I was just justifying why I'm using two surnames. Yeah. Please take your time. No, no pressure. <laughs> no, I didn't mention his name. It just uh, <laughs> the professor Lerata Man, the chairman of the medical dental board from the HPCSA. <laughs> No, Any okay. comments from your side, Prof? You want to say something? No, no, no. I think we're looking forward to seeing how this uh, information is going to be used in clinical practice. I think it's important yeah. for translation of research into practice. And Absolutely. I think that's where most of the questions are leading to. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, thanks a lot for that comment, Prof. Uh, Dr. John Bohopa, uh, it's for you to do the vote of thanks and close your remarks. Good evening, um, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Dineo Tzabet, uh, a brilliant, brilliant presentation, uh, colleague. I'm, I'm left beyond words, you know. Listening you through your presentation, I, I don't know whether I was listening to a, a medical specialist or a um, actual scientist, or, or in an international supermodel. Uh, ah! no, no Spanish. I think uh, it was a it was a combination. <laughs> really a combination of everything. But uh, um, indeed, we are in the era of uh, of you know um, groundbreaking stuff and uh, the ushering of a new breed and a new you know uh, talents you know in the medical profession. And uh, we. Thank you on behalf of you know Clinics Health Group for obviously honoring us with such a brilliant presentation. Clearly, you are, you are not just a doctor, and um, we wish you wish you the best of success you know going forward. And uh, for those you know colleagues who might have missed that SMS number, I got it. It's four seven five eight seven, and the SMS is Dineo Tsavete. We'll yes. certainly be rooting for you. We'll Thank certainly you. be rooting for you on behalf of Clinics Health Group, um, Dr. Bila, who uh, you know manages and runs this you know webinars weekly. Uh, we thank you, and uh, and obviously on behalf of uh, you know Clinics, you know Executive Committee and the management, uh, we thank you very much and good luck with your future you know endeavors, uh, Dr. Tavetsa. We thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, colleagues, and have a good evening. All right. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.